Um, uh, Faye was uh, Faye did his PhD at uh, um, University of Pennsylvania in 2007. Uh, he did a postdoc at Berkeley and then spent uh, seven years at uh, University of Southern California before very recently becoming uh, moving to UCLA where he's an associate professor. Okay. Uh, what? Oh, uh, I think he's here. Uh, can I? I just put it here. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so it's great to be here. Um, so first, I apologize for, you know, last minute I decided to change uh, the title of the talk. <laughs> this is somewhat uh, inspired um, that, um, if you recall this morning, um, Professor Pojo uh, asked the one of the two questions <coughs> about shallow network versus deep learning, when and where um, shallow uh, deep learning network is better than the shallow network. So. So what I'm going to talk about, some, some answer along this direction, but from a very different perspective, uh, more or less empirical per perspective instead of a theoretical perspective, OK? Um, so all right, so, so let me start um, you know, give, setting up the stage, talk a little bit about um, the background of this uh, uh, study. Um, so I was talking about this uh, representation learning and why we want to do it. Then I'm going to contrast two methodology which many of you have already heard about, deep learning, or deep neural network versus the kernel method. Okay. Um, so let's say this is a very toyish example. Suppose we want to do uh, face recognition. Let's say we want to uh, design a system looking at uh, images and dis uh, facial images and decide whether this is male or female. Okay. So the typical way we're going to do that is we're going to collect a lot of labeled image as our training data. Okay. So this is this side is guy, this side is girl, and we're going to get this bunch of them. Then we're going to represent image, each image as a point in some space. Um, then we're going to fit a model or decision boundary to, to this training data point. Okay? So then we do our you know, evaluation, and we will be happy to use this decision boundary for future classification. Okay? This is a very classical uh, machine learning you know, recipe or steps about how to come up with a classifier, okay? But in fact, this is not so trivial because the crucial step here is how would you represent image uh, in what kind of space, okay? So this is the left, uh, left being our answer. Um, there are many, many choices. Let's say there are two of them. One is super simple. You take the raw image and just, you know, take the pixel value and stack them up as a vector or two-dimensional matrix. It's fine. Otherwise, it's more complex. So you take the image over here. You do a bunch of a key, uh, interesting point, key points detection. Go through some descriptor. You go through some um, uh, dictionary. Uh, eventually, come up with some histogram. And you take all those histograms, combine them together. They also become uh, a description of the image, and use that to represent the image in some space. So this is a, you know, sort of a multiple step pipeline in order to come up with a description. A representation. So which one is better? So um, this is actually problem de uh, dependent, but we could come up with a few criteria to say what are the good ones uh, for representation. Computationally, we want something simple, right? We want something easy to compute and convenient to manipulate. Statistically, let's say we use this representation to build a classifier to make predictions. Obviously, we want something and those representations are sometimes we call features being informative and discriminative, such that even with the very simple statistic models, we can build a robust, uh, good performing classifiers. Okay? Um, for example, just, just for the heck of it, let's say we have you know, this uh, length of hair as some kind of a representation or some kind of feature for the same age. So this is the good thing about it is that obviously, at least for this training data, um, we can classify every training examples, you know, perfectly without error. Okay, um, it's super easy. You just stretch shooting them down. Now the problem with that is, you know, you, you lost a lot of information, right? The feature, many feature expressions, uh, feature structure get lost. You're only measuring the hair, hair lens. Um, computing from age is also much involved, right? It's not even clear whether this is the ev uh, even easier task than just recognizing this is male or female. So that's, that's the problem of this kind of a representation. Okay? So in fact, uh, for a very long time, um, come up with a good representation of the data, or sometimes called feature engineering, 
has been the major bottleneck for applying uh, machine learning algorithm to building practical systems. Um, so this is the um, image I borrowed from uh, Pedro Domingo's paper, just showing that you know the amount of effort that you need to spend on feature engineering come up with a good representation. And even nowadays, in the past, you can uh, examine and manually checking the data, come up with intuition, and try to extract the features. Now it becomes even more difficult because of the amount of the data, and also because of the dimensionality of the data and the complex um, um, patterns of the data is even more difficult to manually come up with a good uh, representation. Okay, so you can think about representation is the learning problem itself. So you have some kind of raw data. Let's say this is just going to be a pixel value now. It's in some dim high dimensional space. There is a very complex uh, decision boundary. It's how happy to classify. But then what you want to do is learning some transfer, uh, transfer function, uh, transformation function, map the data from this space to this space. Now in this new space, you come up with a classifier. I um, just use the linear decision boundary to show that if you come up with a good representation, your classifier should be fairly easy to construct. Okay? Um, you can make it a little bit formal, putting it into some uh, framework, let's say using empirical risk minimization, you will have a training data uh, image here with a label here. You want to optimize uh, some kind of loss function, but the loss function is computed over some classifier, o uh, over learned transformation uh, representation. Then you sort of minimize uh, uh, this uh, uh, empirical risk with respect to the parameters, parameterize both of the classifier and the representation function. Okay? All right, so this is a fairly you know, intuitive, straightforward concept. Um, so let me now show you two type, very different ways of learning this representation. The first one I've just started with deep learning. Um, this is the one saying, okay, from X to Z, this representation I want to get, what I can do is use deep learning to parameterize this function. So for people um, um, are familiar with this, this deep learning is nothing but a bunch of like uh, uh, hierarchical organized nonlinear processing unit. You start from X over here, eventually output to Z. In the middle, that's a bunch of uh, nonlinear processing unit, and you have those parameters to do weighted sum and do it in, uh, 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 iteratively on the previous layers. Um, the good thing about it, um, it's hierarchically very organized transformation, nonlinear transformation. Uh, it's uh, um, implement highly nonlinear mapping, therefore uh, approximate any smooth function, which you already heard from. Professor Pojo's talk this morning, okay? Now, since about five or six years ago, deep learning has been used um, extensively and has a lot generated a lot of success story. So I think this first started from uh, in speech recognition. And then in computer vision, many tasks using deep learning attend um, the state of art performance, recently language processing and board games, and many, many more. I'm sure we're gonna hear more uh, in the next few years. Uh, this is all great. Um, so now let me say what is not so great about deep learning. Um, for many of the people who are doing um, um, practical applications, now for deep learning there's a lot of uh, hidden knobs, right? I think uh, this morning this even someone asked the question about how would you tune in the uh, systems. There's a lot of uh, design and uh, architecture decisions, how many layers, uh, how many hidden units in each layer. Um, sometimes you can also argue what type of the hidden layer is good. Um, in terms of linear algorithm, you have to worry about step size, momentum, um, uh, decay rate, regularization coefficient, drop power rate, all kinds of uh, um, those knobs. Um, a, a, to fit the deep learning model, you need a lot of data. And you also need a lot of uh, computation. So the, it's very resource demanding. Um, from a theoretical point of view, that um, they're very little or uh, very scarce amount um, of uh, uh, theoretical results to guide us to go through these things. Instead, many of us rely on intuition or previous experience or just simply just run a lot of experiments, try to figure out uh, what are the optimal set of things we should be using here. Okay. So what are the alternatives? Okay. So now I'm going to tell you something super simple, but um, it hasn't been uh, studied uh, extensively in the last uh, year or so, a uh, few years. Okay. So this thing is called a kernel method. Uh, there's a very beautiful insight about uh, kernel method. So suppose 
you know, you see this picture before. There's a bunch of data points you want to draw a decision boundary among them. They are necessarily very complicated. However, imagine that you have this function map to this a very high dimensional space of infinite dimensional space. Now all the decision boundary become super e simple. It become linear decision boundary. And this space, um, if you're using a special type of uh, mapping, is called a kernel feature space. And this function, this this kernel feature space will be actually induced by um, kernel function. The idea of using kernel function is that even we have infinite dimensional space. There are many classifiers in this space. We only need to compute the inner product between those feature vectors. Now, if you have a function, we can compute this inner product explicitly in the original space. Then you really don't need to know what this function looks like. You just evaluate um, this kernel function within the original space, then you are done. Okay. All right. So, um, so we're very fortunate that I think. Uh, this year, this morning, we have the three speakers. We'll even talk about what is the common theme. Um, Professor Vatnik there, and Poju there, and um, Mike there, um, one of the other people who actually instigated the interest in kernel method and advanced things in this area. So it's just a little bit of a side note about this. So now let's say to a little bit formally, kernel trick used in kernel method. The main idea, as I mentioned, is that to, com to use the kernel features representations, you need to compute this kernel function. And in, indeed, you can do, uh, find this kernel function called positive definite kernel function. Um, so they induce some kind of uh, uh, nonlinear mapping in some feature space. And this thing will be our representation. Okay. Um, just to give you an example, for the very commonly used uh, Gaussian kernel function, RBF kernel, all you need to do is compute the distance between the original features. Um, scale them up and take the dimensionation. The mapping in this particular case, you can sort of at least explicitly uh, write it out. You just solve some integral uh, uh, eigenfunctions, eigensystems, then you sort them out, and those are the nonlinear uh, mappings you, you, you can identify. Um, but in most cases, obviously, we're not going to solve this. It's difficult to do. We just use these uh, kernel functions. Okay. Um, kernel functions I consider as a shallow network. You take x, go to z. The only thing you need is one layer of a nonlinearity. So you have those, um, you know, so schematic illustration to show that this is the x. You go through nonlinear transform, and the output will be z, will corresponding to your kernel features. It's a shallow, um, but it's still highly nonlinear. Um, um, often, this you would really need an infinite uh, dimension of this. Um, but nonetheless, it approximates a smooth function. Any smooth function, this uh, again the concept of universal. Um, um, with this, um, kernel method has um, become a very interesting contrast to the deep learning method. There's a lot of things uh, great about the kernel method. It's been expensive studied and well understood, uh, at least theoretically. You can say a lot of things about regularization property and generalization error bound. They have a very nice, appealing, strong computational advantage. In most cases, for kernel method, you can more or less form in a convex optimization problem. I mean, uh, just mentioned that a convex optimization doesn't have suffer from the problem of local uh, minima. So you can you know, use very simple optimization routine to drive it to the global optimal. Now, kernel method typically don't have a lot of uh, hidden knobs. So I'm going to show you in our system when we use kernel method, there's not many hyperparameters you have to tune. It's relatively transparent. One of the criticizing about, uh, criticism about um, deep learning method is that because it is compounded many layers of nonlinearity, you, you cannot, you know, you treat it as a black box. You really cannot open it up to say what's going on. Kernel method sometimes could be called a glorified in your neighbor, but because of that, precisely because of that, when you have a kernel-based uh, uh, method, you actually can sort of open it up and figure out why the class are making this decision, because you can essentially looking at the, this, um, uh, this data points near your neighbors to, 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 to figure out. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you also, to be fair, what is not so great about the kernel method. In practice, computational complexity is, is a nightmare. Okay? So the kernel trick I mentioned is sort of double-bladed sort. It allows you 
escape from explicitly defining what is this nonlinear transformation you are learning to represent data. But then the price is that for every pair of data points, you have to compute this kernel function. Now, if your data point has 10,000, that's OK. If your data point has 10 million, now this become a problematic, because there's no way you can compute 10 million pairwise times 10 million. 10 million matrices are called a kernel matrix, and they're stored in the memory and use them. It's going to be very expensive. So normally, kernel methods uh, are having difficulty to be scaled up to very large problems. Uh, how to choose the right kernel turns out to be also to be a thorny issue. Um, there are infinitely many kernel functions. <coughs> and learning the optimal kernel function from data is, is a st has been studied, but it's far from being uh, solved. Um, so, um, so those are the, some of the issues related to, to the kernel method. I should mention that, that addressing this um, scalability of kernel method uh, has already been studied um, even before the arrival of deep learning. There's a large chunk of work um, in the past tried to scale kernel methods up. And some of our today's uh, work we will talk today we actually got inspired by this. Okay, so what I want to summarize here is that no method is perfect, right? So on this side, you have the deep neural network. It's a deep, um, it's, um, Interesting, kernel method on this side is a shallow. Deep neural network tends to be able to scale to big data uh, easier than the kernel method. But then the kernel method has typically has a stronger and a richer uh, theoretical results that deep learning can only supplement with the strong empirical results. So the key message here is that nothing seems to be perfect. Uh, everyone has its pros and cons. Uh, so then why deep learning has been so hard, right? I, I think um, but, uh, we're not going to deny that. So I think there are, personally, I think there are two myths about this. Um, the first one is related to theoretical reason. Being deep is theoretically necessary, okay? Um, there's uh, um, several works already shown that, uh, I, I, in fact, in t today's, uh, uh, this morning's talk, Professor Podio also mentioned uh, his recent work about uh, why being deep it's good. Right? So, but in general, if this comes in the flavor of the existing functions that you can implementable with D layers of deep learning network. But then if you implement with a shallow learning network kernel, you may need a lot of training examples, a lot of nodes, a lot of parameters. Okay? So this is one of these issues. But um, for that, I'm going to ask you the question, sort of in the spirit of um, Professor Poggio's talk this morning. Do real tasks we care really need this type of function? Are we really in the worst scenario that the, we are actually learning those functions or those are just the worst case analysis? So this is one of the questions uh, we can ask. Another question is that um, kernel methods just have this myth to say empirically, um, they're just not scalable. They're impractical uh, for handle large uh, uh, scale problems. Um, this is true. If you want to solve a kernel classifier um, exactly um, on, the, on the very large scale, that's, that's, you're going to have a quadratic order the complexity that is, it is very hard to scale. But for many real tasks, we only care about solve them approximately. So if we can relax that assumption, if we just solve them uh, approximately, can we actually achieve better scalability? Okay. Um, so what I want to say is that in the last year or so, two years, we, we sort of tried to demystify this myth. There's something interesting I want to say that if we can overcome the issue of scalability, we can harvest the benefits of big data or large data, then what is the true difference between these two paradigms once we throw the power of data out? So the, what remaining is just purely compared to different methods. This will allow us to understand the natures of different tasks. For example, maybe the certain cognitive task or perception task indeed requires to use um, deep learning architecture because they're more difficult than other ones. So this is one of the things you can think of a matching that a certain tasks are easy to solve. You know, kernel method or shallow network is enough, so that certain tasks is more difficult. Uh, how are we going to do that? So um, we're just going to have uh, some empirical comparison on some really tough task. Um, we want to use very large scale data set from real world application. We're not going to make up um, um, data set or download small ones. 
we're going to use a specific task relevant evaluation metrics. This is what people in real world application cares about. And finally, that's another thing very important. Instead of evaluating this uh, uh, two paradigm with certain bias, what we're going to do is evaluate them with equal uh, 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 zlet and try to see uh, in the end which method is better or which method can perform better in what kind of scenario. Okay. So it turns out, we, before we start doing this, it turns out we want to look, look up in the literature to see if anybody else has done this kind of empirical comparison, despite the claim that um, the, the theoretical necessity of a deep learning architecture. It turns out no. Um, so we decided to do it ourselves, and we're just going to fill the void of this uh, lack of empirical evidence. So I'm going to tell you how to scale them up, uh, scaling up a kernel method, and as well as a little um, sort of a me uh, methodology gadget to make the kernel method perform well. And in the end of the day, if you want to know the, so the one-line summary, that's precisely the title, kernel method can perform uh, uh, equally well as, uh, as good as deep learning architectures on some applications. So how to scale kernel method? Uh, the key idea here is that instead of uh, solving kernel-based um, classifier exactly, we're going to solve them uh, approximately. Um, if you recall this uh, sort of a conceptual diagram, in the beginning, I said that you map those data points in a potentially infinite dimensional um, feature space. That's true. But what we're going to do here now, we're going to approximate this space with a finite dimension feature space. So we're going to truncate. We're good, not going to use the full expansion of uh, this nonlinear transformation. We're going to use a subset of them. And these ones will approximate the origin of um, kernel functions. Okay. Um, turns out um, this uh, beautiful line of work a few years ago that uh, done by uh, uh, Rahimi and Racht um, using Monte Carlo approx uh, uh, approximation for kernel computing kernel functions. And their work is based on a very uh, on classical results in harmonic analysis back to 30s. Essentially saying for certain type of uh, positive definite kernels, it's called the translation invariant kernels, what we can do is um, they're going to admit a Fourier transform. If you take the kernel function, perform Fourier transformation, and you will end up with the Fourier transform it turns out to be a, a probabil probability measure. And then the good thing about it, the original uh, x and z representing two data points will, will go through nonlinear transformation and compute the uh, inner product expectation, and this will give you back the kernel function. So this is already prompt a uh, very simple uh, sort of a Monte Carlo sampling scheme to compute this uh, kernel function. What we're going to do is just a sample from this uh, 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 probability measure. And for each time we sample them, then we'll compute the nonlinear transformation and compute uh, the nonlinear transformation on this one. And in the end, we're going to end up with uh, you know, sort of a, a sum instead of an integral of those nonlinear functions in the product, and this will pro approximate the original kernel function. Okay. So graphically, how this is going to look like? It turns out uh, we can draw this almost like a neural network. Um, it's a shallow one. So this is the, our input. This will be our x, and we're going to have one hidden layer. This number of uh, uh, hidden units in this layer will provide a trade-off between. Uh, the Monte Carlo approximation error and how big is the size you want to go. So um, connecting the input to this hidden layer is just a bunch of random variables from that the probability measure I mentioned. For a Gaussian kernel or RBF kernel, this probability measure is just a Gaussian function, Gaussian distribution. You just sample from some normal distribution, you get those numbers. Then you go through the x, this is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the input features or input data, go through this random number, and, and go through some nonlinearity. Now, here you have a little bit uh, different from the your typical neural network. Instead of using rectified linear unit or sigmoid, you here you have to use in cosine transfer function. This is the sort of related to the Fourier transform because um, that's how the nonlinearity com uh, non comes in. Okay? So, what I think here I want to emphasize a little bit um, uh, difference from neural network, deep neural network. The, this bottom layer over here is not adapted to the data. 
Okay, it's a purely sampled from a random uh, distrib uh, from a, a probability distribution. Once you sample them, you fix them. There's no indication to tell you you need to back propagation and adjust the things over here. Okay, but nonetheless, once you sample this, you're able to compute the output of the Hilbert unit. You will be able to use the output of the Hilbert unit as some kind of representation and use them to classify. So this is what they call um, random kitchen sink approach. So the idea now is you get those things, you compute the uh, uh, random projection and go through random summation or go through the nonlinearity, and you have this data uh, representation. And for many of them, you go through another linear uh, classifier. In this case, you can just use any multinomial logistic regression or any things you favor. Then um, this will construct a classifier for you. So this type of style is called a uh, random kitchen sink. Um, there's some nice interesting properties. Uh, it's no longer quadratically dependent on the number of training examples. It only depends on how many random unit you want to have on this hidden layer. And I mentioned this provided a uh, trade-off between approximation error and the size of the model. From here to here, this layer, that's the only adjustable parameter here. So therefore, it's a convex definition if you use multinomial logistic regression or the other classifier. Um, so everything b become um, super easy. There's no back propagation. There's no, um, since it's the convex optimization, you can use a very simple optimization routine to get to it. Okay. All right. So I will also want to point out that the sort of a conceptual link between kernel machines and uh, shallow and deep goes back way back. So you know, this is almost 20 years ago. Uh, Ralph Renew had a paper linking the Gaussian processes and infinite wide in shallow neural network. And it's a few years later, there's a nice paper to show that even you can change those nonlinearity from cosine to some other nonlinearity, you can still get a kernel function out of this shallow neural network. And finally, just recently, our archive paper paper showed you can also take all those uh, network, stacking them up together. But nonetheless, every layer is filled with random numbers, they eventually the whole network will compute something approximate, uh, concentrate around the kernel function. Okay? The nice thing about all this construction that, you know, they, they're very simple to construct and then learn. They're convex definition, they don't need to do back propagation, and they are optimize the parameters only on the top, they're shallow and infinite wide. Okay? Um, as uh, a note, I should mention that a kernel machines, in this case, if you construct this case, it can be very big. For example, in some of our system, we could go up to 200,000 random projections, which means the 200,000 random unit. Um, number of classes we classify could go up to 5,000. Um, to the number of parameters, you know, if you think about it, it's a very wide hidden layer and with a lot of uh, output classes goes up to 1 million learnable parameters. In many cases, I think this is even bigger than um, many deep neural network uh, models. But nonetheless, since those are very complex opposition linear classifier, you can scale them up relatively easily, um, just like a neural network, a deep neural network. Okay. Um, so I want to tell one small thing that in terms of method to make the whole thing work. So this thing, we don't have a good name for it, so I just call it a kernel garbage compactor. Okay, this is the following, the random kitchen sink um, uh, analogy, right? So, so the reason for that is sort of reflecting on this a little bit. It's an infinite, potentially very wide shallow network. It has a lot of parameters. And there's a lot of random number being generated between the input and the hidden layer. So it's not clear all those random numbers are used for. That's why some of them have got to be garbage, right? So what I'm going to mention that we're going to have a garbage compactor to squeeze out the things that are not useful and only give the things that are useful. Okay, and this is our idea. So remember, this is the f you know input layer. You go through random number and you have a very wide network, uh, uh, hidden layers. We're going to go through a bottleneck layer here, and the bottleneck has a linear unit uh, in the middle, and then this goes to the classification or the labeling layer. Um, so why we want to do that? Um, intuitively, this uh, sort of a bottleneck turns to be smaller, has a fewer number of neurons than this. And it turns to serve as some, some, something like a squeeze out of the garbage out and give only providing useful information there. 
Therefore, it provides over, uh, it prevents overfitting. Uh, it also encourages multitasking. This is one of the ideas that actually uh, used in deep learning to argue why deep learning is useful because it allows um, sharing features uh, uh, in multiple tasks. Okay? Um, but mathematically, that's a very simple explanation. Okay? Think about the originally. This is our original model, right? It has a wide la uh, hidden uh, layer and it goes to the um, output. So this is our original parameter. But if we're going to say we're going to force those parameter has a low rank, this is essentially saying this parameter here, theta here, can be written as two low rank matrix multiplying together. So theta one, theta two. And we're going to force them to have a low rank. And a, a direct convex a relaxation would say, given this, the natural relaxation is just regularized with the nuclear norm of the parameter. So it turns out this is actually a convex opposition problem. You can solve them. But in practice, you probably want to solve them this way to be more scalable. So this is the essentially uh, some ideas um, sort of have been a little bit studied, um, but not in the exact form of uh, nuclear norm regularizer. Okay. Um, so now let me tell you some empirical results on real uh, world applications. The one I picked, or we decided to pick, is the speech recognition. That's the first application, deep neural network, to show there's an irrefutable advantage to use deep neural net. That's the one we're going to try out. Okay, so I'll just first tell you the setup and then I'll give you the results. So for people who don't know automatic speech recognition, um, you basically have a speech waveform. You go through some signal processing front end. Uh, you do something called acoustic model. The acoustic model does nothing but uh, take those uh, acoustic feature vector determining at a given, any given time what is the most likely, uh, what is the likelihood of this uh, feature vector come a particular phoneme class. <coughs> Once you have those probability, you mix with something called a language model. You go through some uh, decoder, and eventually you're going to spit out a sentence. Um, believe you have said that. And you have a ground truth here. You go through some evaluation. You end up an uh, evaluation metric called a word error rate. That's what a speech recognition community would care. But typically for machine learning uh, 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 problem, we often model acoustic models with a multi-way classifier. And this will give, uh, uh, let's say, some kind of classification, classification accuracy. But unfortunately, that's not the final metric. The final metric is over here. That's the one we're going to look at. Okay. All right. So the task now I sort of explain. You do acoustic modeling, determining the phonetic states. And you take the probability there. And you go to a decoder and you evaluate on what error rate. The data we're going to use um, uh, contains a three type of language. Um, broadcast news is very large scale and it's very, very popularly used in the speech recognition community. The other two, Bengali and Cantonese, are relatively smaller and they're, they're relatively new data set. But nonetheless, we evaluate them. For the system we, we built, um, we just use a very standard kernel function, Gaussian kernel, Laplacian kernel. Uh, some kind of uh, combination, just the uh, additive, um, uh, add them up together. The relevant features, uh, sometimes we go up to 500,000 features. Um, uh, this often leads to 1 billion parameters. A uh, number of hyperparameters that I mentioned, essentially hyperparameters are bandwidths of the kernel. That's the scaling parameter. The number of uh, features, like I mentioned over here, how many you want to go. The gradient, we use the stochastic gradient. Uh, algorithm and bottleneck size, what is the rank of this uh, bottleneck matrix. For deep neural network, uh, we had two. We have our own training recipe to train a very deep neural network. Uh, we also get the model from IBM research group. This is their industrial strength uh, uh, deep neural network. To, we, we also use their model to assess, um, to, to compete against our kernel method. Okay. Again, I mentioned that evaluation criteria in the world error rate, and to avoid any issues, we also use the IBM proprietary uh, system to evaluate, okay, instead of design our own. So let me show you the results. Okay. So the first, the sanity check. So this is the, for people who are not familiar with the speech recognition, I'm just using MNIST, the, the standard one everybody familiar with, to, sh uh, to do a sanity check. So this, on this line, uh, these two columns are the kernel method. On this side is the deep neural network uh, models. Okay, uh, this is our MNIST. It's a variant MNIST, but essentially augmented with all the um, 
uh, um, you know, small translation perturbation to the data, essential. So the best result we got from kernel is 0.85% error rate, deep neural 0.69% error rate. I know there's a difference, but if you run uh, McNamara p-test, you will find out the p-value is uh, uh, um, 0.45. That's, you know, basically these two methods come up, you know, in, um, um, the difference is insignificant. Now, this is the real task of speech recognition. Okay. Um, this is the IBM deep neural net. This is our deep neural net. We also with Columbia's neural network. Um, we have a, part, a team partner from Columbia. They also work, develop a deep neural net. This is a kernel method. And for each of the language, um, you can tell that for this language, deep neural network does a slightly better. This is the error rate, the lower the better. For Cantonese, the kernel method does slightly better, but for broadcast news, it's roughly the same. Okay. Um, you can imagine this, maybe these two methods are sort of a complementary. So you take MNIST, you're combining the two, best the two, you got to, you know, I, I'm sure this difference is not significant. You take the Bengali uh, on the speech recognition and the Cantonese, you combine them, you improve slightly. Uh, for both news, we just didn't bother to do it because, you know, they, their performance are already very close to each other. So now let me summarize. Um, so um, what I want to um, do a little bit um, um, analysis first, then I can tell you what I think the most important technical message would be. So uh, I didn't tell you exactly how the kernel system um, final kernel system looks like. So now let me show you what they look like. Um, we have a two-stage approach. In the initial stage, we train a kernel garbage compactor. Okay, you already seen this uh, you know, diagram before. Then we take the output of this uh, linear unit as a new representation of the data. Okay, and we, we just basically freeze all the random number here and all the learner parameters here, we just take the output of this linear unit at the new representation. Then we train another garbage uh, compactor on top of this new representation. And that goes to the output to tell us which class uh, acoustic feature it belongs to. Okay? So this is just the two-stage approach. When there's no back propagation, even they stack on top of each other. Um, there's no back propagation. Okay, so this is our final system. Um, this is something we're actually not too s unfamiliar with. It turns out, if you think about it, this first stage over here is doing some kind of supervised dimensionality reduction. Right? You take the uh, raw feature here, you come up with a new representation, and in the middle of you doing that, you're using labeled information to extract some features. And if you have heard about uh, canonical correlation analysis, is one form of that. Supervised dimensionality is another form of that. Uh, it's one type of a supervised dimensionality. Okay? So once you've done that, you go through a kernel class based classifier. So what do they say? This is basically a classical machine learning recipe, just work very well. All you need to do is come up with a good feature extraction. So the typical alphabet are super well familiar with is PCA, CCA, you know, feature discriminant analysis, the kernelized version, all the things you can use, and that's what you can end up having over here. Then you go through a model fitting. You can choose whatever your classifier you like the most, uh, linear classifier, kernel-based, boosting, or maybe you can even stacking a new network on top of that. So this is the standard um, machine learning recipe, and there's no surprise there, okay? Uh, it, again, for this part, as I mentioned, this is the analogous to kernelized CCA, which uh, should have been studied almost 12 years ago, okay? So the technical message, I think that, I don't think there's any magic in either deep learning or deep neural network or the things we have done. Uh, each method, uh, no method is magic or uh, penancy, right? So for deep neural net, obviously, you, we have the same kind of uh, uh, problems and cons for the kernel methods, we have the same thing. Uh, in the garbage compactor, it's somewhere in the middle. It is a two layer instead of a one layer, uh, uh, one layer shallow network. It is, uh, but nonetheless, it's not multiple layers. And the good thing about it is it's been stage-wise trained. Therefore, there's no error back propagation. Therefore, it's a f computationally, it's easier. It's not too shallow or deep, that's what I mean. It's a so, sort of a Goldilocks type of algorithm sitting in the middle of these two. 
case. So the detailed work is on this archive and the ICAS paper focused on speech recognition application. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the bunch of people who are actually getting involved with this, including IBM Speech Group, um, um, our friends from Columbia, as well as my student uh, from USC. Uh, in fact, two of them here, Jimmy and Ali here. So if you have questions specifically how we construct those uh, large-scale kernel-based -based learning system, you should ask them you know, offline. And that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? So it seems like it, the very first step is you take the input vector and you project it against a large number of templates, right? Like, to, uh, what did you say, 500,000 templates? Uh, could go up there, but I, I think in the final system, I used the 25,000. OK, so what is the dimensionality of the input vectors that you're using? The input vector is about uh, 360, right? 360, yeah. So do you believe these methods would scale to the case, say, where the input is an image with like a million input dimensions? I don't believe, even for convolution ed, we, we're going to have a future that as big as the image. So I believe it would scale, but I need adaptation. <coughs> so for example, instead of looking at all the, all the dimension, all the pixels in this image, mm -hmm. you would use the smaller filters and, and project onto this, then combine them together. Yeah. So good question, but I think uh, Joram Singer had some answers to that on his recent archive paper. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Do you think you can uh, get? Do you think you can get similar results on CIFAR or ImageNet? Ah, wonderful question. Um, I think my student there knows precisely the answers about this. In the beginning, we tried those experiments. So, I believe I can say the following. I think the kernel method match the performance of deep neural net on those data sets. However, it will not match the performance of a convolution net on those data sets. The reason being convolution net has a lot of a pry uh, uh, design architecture trick to put in there. But as I said, I'm optimistic that if we adapt the idea, some main idea from here, there is a chance to match um, um, convolution net even on those uh, larger scale image data sets. Um, do you think uh, because there's no backpropagation and errors and that you're not training all these parameters simultaneously that this can actually prevent overfitting? Um, you're, you're saying because we are not do, uh, doing backpropagation, they are potentially prevent overfitting, right? Uh, I think that's a valid point. Um, the, the, I think eventually you have to, to balance that, you know, on the trend if you don't do backpropagation and uh, and uh, as you de describe, or preventing overfitting. Uh, I think uh, my, my intuition on this, but I hopefully we can get a more solid theoretical results on this, is that you would want to use the garbage, use the random kitchen sink project to get a, a richer set of uh, representation. Then you gradually shrink them towards the target. I think it, but you, you can build it in a feed forward way such that it, you, you don't overfit, but also you, you don't are, are on the train. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just wondering, uh, can you comment on the fundamental differences between uh, the latent representation learned by the kernel method uh, versus the uh, uh, latent representation learned by the neural network? And oh. uh, how do you realize them and stuff? Um, I think we're actually in the middle of analyzing this because this is a very high dimensional um, vectors, real valued vectors. Um, so I think uh, my, my student have recently plotted some interesting graph to show they are uh, quite a big difference between those uh, uh, latent features from kernel pipeline and, and the deep neural network uh, networks. So they, I, I'm, I'm going to say they are different. They seem to be qualitatively, they are different there already. All right. All right, let's thank Faye again. Sure. Thank you.